Welcome back, everybody. This is our third webinar for lymphedema therapy training. Um, today, we're going to cover uh, a little more the practical side of therapy. Um, so CDT includes manual lymph drainage, bandaging, uh, compression garments, skin care, nail care, and um, self-care management. So we're going to talk a little more closely about these today. Um, so um, I've, I've sent you some handouts and um, you can read through some of the definitions and the history behind how MLD came about. Um, and there are some common, uh, four common basic techniques for manual lymph drainage um, that I'm going to go over. But basically all four techniques are going to be gentle, um, circular stretching of the skin. So the reason we do that, um, sorry, I forgot to turn on my webcam. Um, the reason we do that is because we want to get a, a, we want to stretch the skin where the lymph vessels are underneath that, and we want to get the lymph angions that we discussed last time. We want to increase the motion of the lymph angions, um, and this increases the tissue pressure and enhances the lymph formation. So there's two phases when we when when we do this skin stretching. You're going to have a pressure phase, and you're going to have a relaxation phase. The pressure phase is promoting the movement of fluid in the direction we want to go, the fluid to go, and then we have a relaxation phase, which is where we get a passive distension of the tissues, which leads to refilling of those lymph vessels from the skin. We're going to do this technique at about a rate of one per second, and we usually do five to se seven repetitions in each area. So this is a very gentle technique that we're going to be learning, um, and we're going to try to keep it gentle and slow and rhythmical throughout our whole treatment of the MLD. So we have four basic strokes. There's stationary circles. There's the pump technique. There's the scoop technique, and there's the rotary technique. So these four techniques, I'm going to just show you a, a short video right now that's going to demonstrate what those four techniques look like so you guys can see what the difference is um, when we talk about stationary circles, pump technique, scoop technique, and rotary technique. Okay? So this will just be a short, maybe five-minute video. Axillary lymph nodes for the treatment of the chest on the left side. Big stationary circles in the axillary lymph nodes. And just to be sure, I reposition my hands a little bit more towards the arm for that aspect of the axillary lymph nodes. And then perhaps a little bit closer to the trunk again and do big stationary circles for the preparation of the axillary lymph nodes and our chest treatment on the left. The treatment of the chest is done between the clavicle, our clavicle watershed here along the collarbone, and the transverse watershed just above the navel. So this is our chest area which we're going to treat. And um, we're going to start off with an effleurage just along the sternum out to the acromion a couple times. Then I'm coming around and I prepare the axillary lymph nodes on the left side. After the axillary lymph nodes have been treated on the left side, I'm coming back around to stand on the right, reach over the patient or client, and then go to the left side. On the lateral trunk, I start with stationary circles into the axilla, addressing the pectoral part of the axillary lymph nodes. Stationary circles are conducted with the pressure towards the axilla. 
And once I finished my treatment work here on the pectoral aspect of the axillary lymph nodes, I will then use stationary circles from the transverse watershed, alternating along the side of the trunk up into the axilla, incorporating a little bit of the breast tissue, that is okay. up into the axilla. Of course, those strokes could also be done with both hands in unison. In that case, I would stay five to seven times on one spot and reposition my hand overlapping and gradually work up into the axilla. Under normal circumstances, right over the skin, for manual lymphatics, it is appropriate to work over clothing items, but for the demonstration here, we decided to keep the bathing suit top on, and you will still see the demonstration of the techniques over the bathing suit top. We're going to transition into a pump technique here with my foot hand and a rotary technique executed with my head hand. Pump technique with my foot hand, rotary technique gradually from the sternum to the axilla on my head hand. The pump technique eventually encompasses the breast and the rotary technique finishes it off right into the axilla. Again, this combination is a pump technique with my foot hand, alternating rotary with my head hand, pump technique with my foot hand, Rotary technique with my head hand, arm technique with my foot hand, and rotary technique with the head hand. Please do accommodate all the breast tissue because that's a very important treatment area. And for the work on the patients and clients, work right over the skin in order to affect the lymphatic vessels appropriately. Then from the breast treatment, we're actually going down to a treatment and rotary techniques below the breast, between the breast and the transverse watershed. Since we don't have enough space for both hands together, we do one hand, finish our rotary technique, lift that hand aside, let the other hand do a rotary technique, and even in a small space, work alternating with rotary techniques towards the lateral trunk, and then switching to stationary circles up towards the axilla. Okay, so um, any questions about that video? Are we all good? So as, as he demonstrated, we have stationary circles, which are Circles that you can do either uh, with flat lying fingers together or you can alternate the stationary circles. There's a pump technique, um, which is still like a circle sh shape with the, with the palm of your hand, um, but you're stretching the skin with the entire palm. And the scoop technique, which we'll see more of when I teach you the abdominal uh, stretching of the abdomen, abdomen. And then we have the rotary technique, which is moving of the palm, the skin with the palm and the thumb. All of these techniques have a working phase and then a relaxation phase. Then sometimes we'll do a combination of the pump and st stationary circle and you'll alternate where you saw him using, doing the one hand was pump and the other hand was a stationary circle. So why do we do manual lymph drainage? We talked about this previously. Um, we're going to improve lymph capillary intake, uptake. We're going to increase lymph angioactivity. So the amount of fluid that is moving through the body uh, will increase as we do uh, manual lymph drainage. It has a very soothing effect and pain relieving effect and redirection of fluid around the blocked area. So if we have an area where lymph fluid is not running, then we're going to redirect the fluid to another more efficient area of the body. 
So we talked about this a little bit last time. I just want to go over it. What, what are the contraindications for manual lymph drainage? So we have absolute contraindications. So if a person has acute in, an acute infection like a cellulitis, uh, untreated congestive heart failure, or acute DVT, these are um, uh, absolute uh, contraindications for manual lymph drainage. Uh, with the acute DVT, compression is okay, um, but we would not do the manual lymph drainage. Relative contraindications would be malignant disease and renal dysfunction. For the neck, if we're treating the neck, uh, contraindications for manual lymph drainage in the neck, um, all of the above conditions, as well as if they have cardiac arrhythmia, uh, hyperthyroidism, or hypersensitivity to the carotid sinus, because we are, we are doing our manual lymph drainage or massage right over the carotid sinus area, um, and there's a risk for an acute drop in the arterial, arterial blood pressure and slowing of the heart rate. We also want to be cautious with patients who are over than 60 um, because of the increased possibility of plaque um, in the carotid artery. And we want to be careful about any uh, embolism that might occur because of that plaque. For the abdominal area, contraindications would include um, pregnancy, um, Menstrual period, recent abdominal surgery, those are the two big ones that you want to make sure you don't do uh, manual lymph drainage when um, patient, patients have this condition. For the trunk, you want to be careful if they have osteoporosis or radiation fibrosis um, in the trunk area. So this handout goes over some uh, techniques that we'll be going over in class in Nairobi. Um, you, I would like you to get familiar with these techniques, uh, the neck techniques. The, there's a certain direction we want to work to try to improve the fluid movement into the supraclavicular fossa, which is right here above the clavicle. So we're going to be learning techniques that move the fluid down into the supraclavicular fossa. The back of the neck, um, we're going to be pumping the fluid forward back again into the supraclavicular fossa. Um, we're, we're going to do a little bit with the face, but not much. You can read through this. This is for people who have head and neck lymphedema. Then we have the posterior thorax. We're from the posterior thorax in this quadrant, we're trying to move the fluid up into the axillary lymph nodes. Um, in the front of the, the thorax, you saw as he was doing, we're trying to direct the fluid up into the axillary lymph nodes on that side. We're trying to move the breast fluid into the, into the axilla. Uh, for the upper extremity, lymphedema in the upper extremity is very common after breast cancer surgeries. Um, and we're going to be directing the fluid up again into either the axilla or into the supraclavicular fossa. Um, for the leg, we're going to be moving the fluid up into the inguinal lymph nodes or up and over into the other anastomoses. This is the back of the leg. Again, we have this CHAPS um, watershed here. So you see the direction uh, for the lymph flow is going to go this way for uh, immediately uh, for half the leg and then laterally for half the leg. For the gluteal region, again, we have different directions because of the CHAPS um, watershed. Well, we're going to be directing the fluid again to the inguinal lig ligaments anteriorly. The abdominal treatment, we're going to be learning to do um, manual lymph drainage over the colon, the different parts of the colon. The descending colon is here, ascending colon is here, and then we have the transverse colon. We're going to be stretching the fluid stretching the skin in all three directions. So we'll go over that in class. Uh, I just want you to be familiar with the diagram. And again, we'll be doing a deep breathing technique in all these positions um, for the ab deep abdominal treatment to help clear that fluid into the cisterna chile. So I'll show you some special techniques for fibrotic tissue and how we can break down the uh, fibrotic tissue 
It's a little bit different than manual lymph drainage. We're going to do a little more deeper technique and we're going to, we're going to hold it for a little bit longer to try and break up that um, fibro fibrosis. And you can go ahead and read, read through this. Um, this is a, you know someone who's had breast cancer surgery. They've got a scar here. So this is just showing how we're going to be redirecting the fluid to uh, other anastomoses because we know that these lymph nodes will, will have been affected from the surgery. Okay, any questions about that section, of uh, the MLD section from anyone right now? Looks like we've lost Fatma. Joseph or Fatuma, any questions? No questions so far. Oh, good. Fatuma, I can hear you. I'm okay. I'm okay. Nice. Yeah. No question. Okay. I think we lost Fatma. I'm not sure what happened. Um, okay, so let's move I'm not, on. I'm around. I'm around. No, yeah, let's move on. Sorry, I mean Fatma from Mombasa. Oh, she, oh, Mombasa, okay. Yeah, I see she's back now. Okay, um, and Abraham, have you joined us as well? Okay, so we're going to continue on. Um, our next uh, topic that we're going to discuss is bandaging. So after we do the manual lymph drainage, we're, we're now going to continue on and do bandaging um, to try and reduce the flow. So let's... So let's talk about the different types of bandages. So in lymphedema, we're going to be using something called short stretch bandages. Um, there's different types of bandages out there. Long stretch bandages is most commonly seen in sports injuries. And then we have different types of bandages that we use for uh, chronic venous insufficiency and wounds. So the, the factors that affect the pressure uh, on the limb are going to be the type of bandage that you use, uh, the application, amount of tension that you apply with the bandage, the number of layers we use, and the law of Laplace. So the law of Laplace states that pressure is e e equal to tension divided by the radius. So the tension that is delivered from the bandages even if the tension applied is even, the smaller the radius of the limb, the greater the, the pressure that's applied on those tissues. So if we look at this limb, if there's a smaller radius at the bottom, that, that person with the same amount of tension is going to feel more pressure towards the bottom than they do at the top because of the, the radius. Um, even if you, so it's, if you apply the same amount of tension throughout this whole bandage, you're going to see um, that the patient's going to feel more pressure at the bottom because the radius is smaller. So th these are uh, an example of bandaging supplies. We are going to be having some of these supplies in our, um, in our training when in Nairobi. So you will become familiar with all of these. You don't need to learn, you don't need to know all the names of these right now. Um, there are two big companies in the U.S. that supply these bandages. One is called BSN, which uh, this blue, all the blue products are from BSN. And then there's another company called Lohman and Rauscher, which I'm going to be bringing some of those supplies with me. So we're going to try out some of these um, supplies. We're going to try out the bandaging so that we can learn to, to do it. It is a very important part of lymphedema therapy. Um, so the main component of the lymphedema bandage is the short stretch bandage. So there's two different names in, from BSN, it's called, um, there's just two brand names. It's Comprolan or Rosadol. Um, these are purely cotton bandages. They're used as a multi-layer bandage and the therapist or the patient who's applying the bandage controls the amount of, of pressure or tension on that bandage. Um, you can wear it for a long period of time, and they are washable and reusable bandages. So we have to think about two different types of pressure when we're applying the bandages. There's working pressure, which is when we're moving, 
and there's resting pressure. Resting pressure is the amount of pressure the bandage exerts on the tissue at rest. So when you're sitting down or you're sleeping, how much pressure is coming onto the tissues from the bandage? That's called resting pressure. Working pressure, on the other hand, is the resistance the bandage creates against the muscle and joint during exercise or when the patient is moving. So short stretch bandages have a low resting pressure and a high working pressure. This is really important. So this is the important part about the short stretch bandage. When we're, we're lying down, there's a low resting pressure on the with the bandage. But when we're moving and working and doing our, our uh, exercises, this pressure is a high working pressure, which means that there's high pressure on the tissues, which helps our lymphedema and our lymph angions to contract better and um, push fluid out of our limb. Long stretch bandages, these are ACE bandages that um, we often see with uh, sports injuries. These have a high resting pressure and a low working pressure. So when the person is resting and they have um, the ACE wrap on, this is when they're feeling the most pressure. So why do we do lymphedema bandaging? It increases tissue pressure uh, and it reduces filtration. It prevents reaccumulation of fluid. So we've done our manual lymph drainage. We've tried to get some of the fluid out of the limb. And now we want to apply the bandage so that that fluid doesn't reaccumulate in the tissues. Um, it also breaks up any lymphostatic fibrosis when adding um, the compression and, to do, and by doing movement. So if a patient has really hard fibrosis or thickened tissue, you're going to apply the bandage and then ask them to do their exercises, and this is going to help break up the fibrosis, make it looser. And once it's looser, now it's going to be softer, and the lymph fluid is going to move better in the body. The other thing it does is it enhances the muscle and joint pump. So we have our, we have our skin and we have our muscle, and now we have our bandage, and as the muscle is working, it's going to put pressure on that lymphatic system, and that's going to create a muscle and joint pump. So when do we do bandaging? We do it um, bandaging you'll see being used for lymphedema, uh, CVI, when we have a combination of venous and lymphatic edema, lipedema, which is the accumulation of the fatty tissue that we talked about earlier, um, if you have post-traumatic -tra edema or post-surgical edema, you'll see bandaging being used. It's very effective, except we don't want to do bandaging. Again, same thing, the same contraindications apply. If a patient has acute infection or an arterial wound, arterial disease, um, we talked about ABI in the last webinar. ABI is ankle brachial index. So if we, know, if we know from the vascular clinic that their ABI is low, we're not going to do bandaging. And this is because we don't want to compress the arteries. Um, if they have an acute DVT, cardiac edema, or acute trauma, um, we're not going to do bandaging on these people. Relative contraindications, if they have sensory deficits, um, if they have um, malignancy, diabetes, uh, paralysis, poor cognition, or altered mental status. And this is because these people are not going to be able to tell us um, if the bandage is too tight. So how are we going to apply the bandaging? You're going to apply the bandages in multiple layers. Um, and we're going to use different widths of the bandages. Uh, we're going to use 6, 8, 10, and 12 centimeters. And we'll go over this in class. We're going to be overlapping the bandages by about 50%. And we're going to manage the tension while we're applying the bandage. So we're going to be pre-stretching the bandage about 50%, and then we're going to apply the bandage. Um, and we're going to try to maintain their functional mo mobility so that they can move and improve that muscle joint pump that I was talking about. So um, we'll go, I'll just show you some pictures now of what it looks like, the layers that we use when we do the bandaging. We're going to do five layers typically, a lotion, a stockinette. We're going to put on finger and toe bandages, put on some sort of padding, and then we're going to follow it up with the short, short stretch bandages. 
So um, step one, apply the moisturizer, apply the stockinette. Uh, we're going to do finger and toe bandages. This is so that the in, we individually wrap the fingers and the toes so that none of the fluid accumulates in the distally. Um, padding, there's different types of padding, and I'm going to show you a few different types. In this picture, you, you can see they, they're using gray foam as well as something called Artiflex or a cotton padding. And that's to protect the skin um, and uh, um, just for people who are a little more sensitive. It also reduces the fibrosis um, and it makes the bandage a little more even. Hi, Fozia. Yes. Hi, Victoria. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so you don't have to you don't have to learn the names of these now. We're, I'm going to be trying to bring some of these products so that we can learn to use the padding and then um, find find the appropriate materials over there for you to use. Again, this is the short stretch bandage. Um, it's the main compo component that delivers the compression, and it's applied in various widths and multiple layers. Um, we're going to be learning how to do this bandaging with the short stretch bandage in class. There's something called a pressure gradient. Um, so basically, we want to make sure that the pressure um, should steadily decrease from distal to proximal. So the highest pressure is usually located at the ankle or the wrist. And then as you go up, you'll notice that the bandage actually gets a little bit, feels a little bit looser. Um, so we're going to assess the gradient pressure and provide, then we're going to provide wearing instructions. So we, we tell the patient to remove the bandage if it's painful. Uh, you don't need to add elevation when you're bandaged. And um, we're going to provide them with weekend instructions for bandaging. Hi, Fozia. Hello. Nairobi, we are on. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. All right, so, oops. Okay, so uh, again, I just talked about there's two different companies here in the U.S. that provide um, bandages. Uh, over there in Kenya, I think there's um, BSN Medical, um, and possibly Loman and Rusher is there as well. Um, but definitely BSN Medical is provided. They have these uh, components for us to use. Um, so I'm just going to show you an example of what the upper extremity bandaging looks like. Oh, okay. Um, we won't, I, um, basically, I don't have a picture here of the upper extremity, but the lower extremity is very similar. Uh, we'll probably see it in the in a future session. Any questions about bandaging? Everybody understand how the bandaging works? Okay, so the next section I'm going to talk to you about is role of exercise with lymphedema. So now we have we've gone through the manual lymph drainage. We've done bandaging. Now we're going to instruct the patient on exercise. So there's different um, protocols for exercise that I'm going to go through right now. There's In this handout, there's a lot of uh, studies and evidence that shows why we do this type of exercise with lymphedema patients. I'm not going to go through each of the studies. I want you to go through and read them. Um, and we'll, today we'll just discuss um, why, we do the, why we do these types of exercise with lymphedema patients. All right, so in this, in this um, section, we're going to go over a few different guidelines. We're going to go over um, guidelines of exercise that we do during the intense and maintenance phase of, ex of, of lymphedema therapy. And then we're going to talk about activity rest restriction guidelines in a number of different cases, as well as exercise guidelines for a, a few different cases. So you're going to see this slide over and over again. We're just going to go through point by point for all these scenarios. Okay. So let's go to the first one. Um, so 
So we talked about the components of CDT, uh, manual lymph drainage, compression bandaging, skin and nail care we talked about last webinar, and now we're going to talk about exercise. So there are two phases of lymphedema therapy. We have our intense phase, which is when a patient is in the bandages for the first three, four weeks of therapy, and then they're going to go into the maintenance phase, which is when we'll use our compression garments. Um, so historically, um, the Foldy Clinic, you, you might read about this clinic. This is a clinic in Germany, which is kind of where the lymphedema uh, therapy started. Um, at that clinic, and they still, they still have that clinic in Germany, and there's still many, many patients who go there with severe cases of lymphedema. Um, so in the Foldy Clinic, remedial exercises were performed while wearing the bandages, again, um, because to improve the muscle joint pump. But historically, um, you can read through the different ways that bandages were used. Um, again, uh, sorry, exercise was done. And again, it's because we want to use do the exercises with the bandages on and we want to create a working pressure. Um, I'm just going to skip through the historical guidelines. Um, and basically, the National Lymphedema Network um, had a position paper on exercise, and they concluded that lymphedema ex remedial exercise is part of the treatment for lymphedema when reduction of size of the limb is necessary. It involves active, repetitive, non-resistive motion of the involved body part. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit later that resistance exercises is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we're going to do exercise in phase one and phase two with compression as an essential part of the whole lymphedema therapy. So this is a, uh, you know, this is a picture that shows you full joint range of motion and deep breathing, which is really good for the whole lymphatic flow. Um, this person is using a Pilates reformer. If we don't all have access to that, but this is, this shows a great picture of how you can utilize the full motion you can do this with bandages on, and you're going to get a really good muscle and joint pump happening. So why do we do exercise and bandaging? Again, um, it has been shown that there's a positive correlation between tissue pressure and lymph flow. So remember, the short stretch bandages uh, have a high working pressure, and then we do exercise, which creates that high work, work of the muscle and the joints. And that, in combination with the bandaging and movement, is going to soften up any fibrosis or any pitting edema so that our lymphatic system can flush out that fluid. So, you know, there's different types of exercise. People do all sorts of things. Um, the big thing is that patient is moving. It doesn't really matter if they're doing Tai Chi or yoga or you know, uh, walking. Walking is very, very important. Uh, doing some weight training. This is all really, really important exercise that the patient can do. So the active phase, you want to, um, we want to put the bandages on and then have them do exercises. Um, we, we don't just want to do the uh, edema region, but also the neck and trunk to facilitate the lymph flow. Remember we talked about in the anatomy section how everything is going back up into the venous circulation. So we want to do exercises for the neck and the trunk as well. And I'll, I'll show you in class some exercises that we can do to, to facilitate um, removal of the, um, the, the fluid that accumulates in the thoracic duct. Um, so we're going to use gravity or light resistance throughout the range of motion, deep breathing, and trying to increase the patient's heart rate. So, you know, we're trying to in, uh, improve the patient's independence when we're doing our exercise therapy. So we want to improve flexibility and strength of the edema region, but we also want to exercise um, do exercises that will improve their movement overall, general fitness. Here's some examples of some exercise that we can do using a, a wand or a ball or swimming 
or you, they can just do some flexibility exercises and push into this band, a TheraBand. Lots of different exercises you can have the patient do just to get them moving. Some more exercises for the core. Really, again, in trying to improve their movement and breathing and overall uh, health. So what if the patient can't do exercise? Um, if there's paralysis, you can have the, the caregiver do some passive movement and stretching. Um, if the patient is very tired because of cancer treatments, we can have them do, just do isometrics or stretching or just some active movement at home. Um, if the patient has a lot of truncal edema, um, the pool is a good place for them to go, um, especially if you're not if you can't do bandaging there. Um, so, or if the patient is just very deconditioned or uh, has very poor balance, um, they will they will benefit from from pool exercises. Studies uh, showing active and passive lower extremity movement using bio impedance shows that when they do um, they do that they do go in the pool they have improved lymphatic drainage. So uh, you know why do we use pool therapy? Um, when you're in the water, you have less weight from gravity, you have more buoyancy, promotes relaxation, um, it, it reduces the inflammatory response, and there's a natural compression gradient when you go in the water. There's hydrostatic pressure, which puts pressure on the tissues. Um, 22.4 millimeters of mercury for every 12 inches of immersion. So that's just like wearing a compression garment, a low compression garment. So it's very, very good. Um, however, you want to be careful. You don't want to do too much too soon. Um, some patients can get hypotensive when they get out of the water. Um, if they're getting red because they've been in the pool too long or if they have increased lymph load, then we, we want to be careful with, with um, going into the, into the pool too much too quickly. Um, So here, if someone says to you, you know, what's the, what, what do I have to do? So this is something you can tell them. 15 minutes of specific lymphedema exercises are performed every morning while still in the bandages. So they're, they've, they're, they've been wearing their bandages all night. They wake up. Now you want them to move for 15 minutes of, of lymphedema exercises. Um, muscle movements while bandaged can increase the volume and the pressure of the lymph flow which may eventually lead to formation of collateral lymphatic vessels. So this is in the maintenance phase. We want to, we want to improve their lymphatic flow, um, and we want to get their, their muscles moving while they're bandaged. Uh, in the clinic, we can give them exercise routine uh, handouts. If you guys have VHI, the, the exercise VHI program, there's a lymphedema program in there. Um, you can have group classes where you have all your lymphedema patients come together to do exercise. This will motivate them, give them a group setting, give them, you know, some reason to try and come and do the exercises. You can do, um, there can be pool therapy exercise classes offered. Um, we can have oncology specific classes if you have enough oncology patients. And then, of course, the patient can go to very, um, you know, General, uh, general classes like Zumba or yoga, aerobics classes if they're able to. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, restriction guidelines. So post-surgical restrictions, what are we going to tell our patients? Uh, how are they supposed to limit their exercise when they're post-surgery? So in the past, every, um, you know, a lot of people used to say, don't lift more than 15 pounds or you can cause lymphedema. Patients got very worried and when they did get lymphedema, they thought they, they tended to blame themselves because they lifted their grandchild or something like that. Um, this isn't true. This is very old guidelines. Um, there's no specific number that they shouldn't be lifting. Um, we're going to go over some other guidelines, but um, movement and and Moving is good for the patient and after surgery, um, but we, we are going to give them some guidelines. 
um, patients in the past used to be, get really scared because they thought that if they were doing a lot of exercise, this is going to cause lymphedema. Um, but there's a lot of studies that show that patients who are very active never get lymphedema. And then there's other patients who don't move and they still get lymphedema. Um, there's no, the, the research behind why people get lymphedema and when they get it is very limited. So some people will get lymphedema really soon after their, their surgery. And other people might not get it for three years or 10 years or 20 years after their surgery. There's no, there's no, nothing showing why someone gets lymphedema when they get it. Um, so we talked earlier about different types of lymphedema. There's primary lymphedema or secondary lymphedema. Um, usually we're going to see most cases are from the cause caused by cancer or treatment of cancer. So patients who have lymph nodes removed, um, they have scar tissue or adhesion, they've had radiation therapy, or maybe they're on hormone therapy after cancer treatment and they have weight gain. And weight gain goes with increased lymph load, and increased lymph load can possibly cause lymphedema. Or it could just be the cancer itself that's causing the lymphedema. So here are some uh, statistics on the most common ca uh, causes of lymphedema in the U.S. Uh, different dif different uh, studies are showing different amounts of uh, lymphedema cases in the U.S. So this is um, just an opinion. Um, edema that we see after uh, surgery uh, usually lasts about six weeks. This is not lymphedema. This is post-op edema. This is normal after surgery to see about six weeks of edema in the patient's limb or their head and neck or trunk. Um, and this edema will, will return to normal level uh, within about six weeks. You do want them to participate in post-surgical range of motion exercises, but they're going to temporarily avoid activities that can overwhelm the affected region with inflammation. So, you know, things that are uh, above and beyond what they would normally do. So bowling or contact sports, um, you would want to avoid swimming if they have an open incision. So we want to avoid inactivity it means we want to get them to return to normal activities as quickly as possible after surgery. You want to tell your patients that they need to get back to their normal activities um, and exercise as much, much as they can during and after non-surgical treatments. So we're going to ask them to li limit. The only thing we're going to ask them to limit is overhead reaching to 90 degrees for at least seven days um, after axillary node removal. Um, and the reason we do that is we don't want to have a seroma form. So a seroma... A seroma is a uh, fluid-filled sac, and it's an enclosed sac, and it develops in the axilla underneath, um, underneath, underneath the skin. And when you press it, it's like it's a it's fluid; it moves around. So um, this this is a picture of seroma that's under the chest wall. So it's it's in the whole chest underneath, and and there's fluid there. So we want to prevent that seroma fo forming. So there were some studies done, and basically that they showed that if they delay exercises for a week, the the um, the incidence of seroma went down. So that's what we're going to tell our patients, and maybe even two weeks of not lifting their arm past 90 degrees after they've had uh, breast cancer surgery. Uh. This is just going over the, um, the, the studies that, that they went through um, to give that restriction. So the next uh, activity restriction, we talked about post-surgical. Now we're going to talk about patients who are at risk for lymphedema. So there was another uh, study done, and you can read through this study that shows um, they had an, a no activity restriction group and an activity restriction group. Um, and the results were that there was no big difference if the patient did activity or they didn't act, do activity. Uh, their uh, upper extremity lymphedema 
occurred the same in both, pretty much the same in both groups. So why would we want, we don't want them to be restricted in any kind of treat, uh, exercise. We want them to move and we want them to uh, move within reason. So again, um, very little evidence is available, but we want the patient to control their body weight, avoid obesity. We want them to avoid contact sports and use protective padding if they're, use, if they're playing sports. And just follow the upper extremity guidelines um, until they further until more research is done on this. Salvia? Yes. Hi, it's Salima. Just a quick request, um, Joseph, are you able to mute the microphone on your computer? Joseph, can you hear us? Joseph, can you please, do you know how to mute, can you mute the microphone on your side? I've muted everybody, but if you, I, I'll try to, um, if you have something to say, then just um, maybe message me, or I'll try to unmute everybody when um, when I have when I give some time for questions. Um, but please, if you have a question about anything I'm saying, you can just go ahead and um, and let me know. You can message me, okay? So um, we've got. So this is just some guidelines for head and neck um, and breast lymphedema. Uh, so there's no real guidelines for activity or exercise in the literature. Um, the, the onset of this type of lymphedema does not appear to be as related to activity or exercise as it is for the upper or lower extremity and lymphedema. So maybe just have the patient, um, you know, it, the lymphedema may get aggravated by bouncing or uh, inverted positions, increased high intensity aerobic exercise. So you just want to ask the patient to let you know um, if um, they have, you know, any symptoms, heaviness, fullness, sensations after they do some type of exercise. And then you guys can come up with a more tailored plan for them. So when they when they are doing their exercise in this um, in in these people, we want to make sure that they're well supported. So for the breast, you may want to ask them to wear a sports bra or a, a body shaper tank top or um, foam pieces, which which I'll show you. Um, for the genital uh, lymphedema, you can have them wear compression shorts or genital support. And for the head and neck population. Um, there are facial compression things that you can get um, or they can consider doing uh, aquatic therapy. So what are the activity restrictions for those who already have lymphedema? So for these people, we want to make sure that they're wearing their bandages or their garments during the activities that increase heart rate or blood flow to the affected region. Um, if the, swollen, if the swollen region becomes larger or there are increased symptoms of fullness or heaviness during or after the activity, they want to tell you about that. Um, if the swollen region becomes firmer during the activity, we want to make sure that they're in the appropriate compression while they're doing their activities. Leading a sedentary lifestyle was associated with an increased risk of breast cancer-related lymphedema. So, lymphedema. so you know, we really want to encourage these patients to move and get moving. And so um, we're, we're encouraging to, to them to keep their body weight low and to keep that lymph moving around in their body so that we can make sure that it doesn't accumulate. Encourage your patients to stay active. So the last thing we'll talk about are exercise guidelines um, for the different at-risk limb, those with stable lymphedema, post-surgery, and during and after cancer treatments. This is pretty much a, a review of what we just talked about. Um, 
the old guidelines, like I mentioned, were, you know, patients shouldn't lift more than so, so many pounds that their doctors told them. This is not true. Um, pe people still believe that if they lift a certain amount of weight, that will cause them lymphedema. But this is just based on fear. And there's no research that shows this. Um, so, um, you know, we want to, there's some, so, some studies done with patients who have breast cancer and, uh, they do exercises. Um, I'm not going to go through the study with you, but basically, um, the findings showed that, uh, the control group, and the rest of the groups, there was no significant difference. And so the patients, who, um, sorry, the, the, the difference in this group was the patients who, who were doing resistance training had less reoccurrence or less lymphedema show up. So the recommendation is for patients to do um, a little bit of resistance training when they're, um, when they're at risk for lymphedema. It um, hopefully will reduce their risk of getting lymphedema. Um, this study had patients doing um, exercise twice a week for 90-minute sessions, and they progressively in, uh, increased the repetitions and the weight. Um, and we can go through some setup of exercise programs that you can do. Basically, you know, you want to gradually increase their weight. Uh, this, these guys did two sets of 10 repetitions. Then they increased to three sets of 10 repetitions. And the resistance was um, then increased after, after that, after they were able to tolerate the three sets without any increased symptoms. Um, so they, and they were doing it twice a week, two to three times a week, and they're just doing it gradually, but they're using, they are doing resistance training um, and slowly improving their weight over time. So there have been eight randomized controlled trials that have all shown that upper body exercise, aerobic and resistance training, does not contribute to the onset or worsening of lymphedema among survivors. So there's no reason to tell these patients that they should not be doing aerobic or resistance training. All the, all the studies are showing that um, the patients should be doing aerobic and resistance training. It will not worsen their lymphedema. The only variable that was shown to predict onset of lymphedema was actually body weight, a BMI greater than 25. Um, so these are the, this is what we want to do. We want to get these patients to try and um, exercise and move so that they keep their body weight down. Again, um, the... The, pe the patients who are at risk for lymphedema, we want them to stay physically ac active during and after treatment. Different types of treatment, um, different types of exercises they can do, whatever they feel, will, whatever you can do to motivate them to move is the important thing. Um, whatever they were doing before, you want to get them back into their regular routine of moving. And if they weren't, if they were pretty sedentary before, then this is really important to tell them to start to get them motivated to start moving again. So benefits of exercise are improved fitness, quality of life and body weight or body composition and reduced accelerated bone loss. So patients who are on hormonal therapy after breast cancer surgeries or breast cancer diagnosis, they can get early bone loss and go into early menopause, um, could happen after chemotherapy, um, and this is due to the uh, exposure to estrogen from the medications. So we want to get these people moving and doing some weight training uh, with resistance to, so that they don't have accelerated bone loss. Breast cancer survivors receiving post-op chemotherapy are almost five times more likely to experience a vertebral fracture a year following treatment than their healthy counterparts. So again, the chemotherapy drugs make them more susceptible to getting osteopor osteoporosis. So we do want to encourage weight-bearing exercises for these patients. So for people with stable, stable lymphedema, they did some studies 
Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the study, but I encourage you to read through and, and see what they were studying. Um, so the findings were that there was no significant difference between the exercise group and the no exercise group in the proportion of women who had a change in limb swelling. So they were trying to see which patients, um, if there was more swelling once they did uh, lymphedema and weightlifting. Um, and actually weightlifting reduced the number and severity of arm and hand, hand symptoms. So we want to get these patients again into a, a program of weightlifting. Um, Post-surgical, I've already gone through this. Uh, temporarily avoid activities that can uh, affect the region uh, with inflammation for six weeks. Um, that's something that they weren't doing beforehand. And again, we want to, if patients are going through radiation therapy, then we don't want to stretch that radiated skin. We want to avoid swimming. Um, we, you want to avoid strength training of the muscle uh, within the radiation field. Um, we might not be able to do compression therapy for patients who've had radiation. Um, the garments might irritate their skin because it'll be very um, delicate skin. Um, and they might, they might get, if they, they sweat too much from the exercise, then you have to remember that, um, the excessive sweating may further compromise the irritated tissues. So we want to be careful with the radiated tissue. Um, but I think the, the overall, the overall consensus with all the studies is that the, the benefits of exercise outweigh the risks of, of doing the exercise. Um, even with cancer therapy, the patients undergoing chemotherapy, they can gain strength and safely part participate in cardiovascular training, can safely participate in strength training without risking the increasing the risk of lymphedema. Um, independent of, of treatment, three quarters of breast cancer survivors have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease at 10 years. So again, this has to do with their, the, the, the treatment that they've had, uh, the drugs that they're taking, the medications that they're on, increasing obesity, and possibly increasing cardiovascular disease. And of course, if, they're, if, if, if patients are obese, there's the study that we saw earlier that shows that they have an elevated risk of getting lymphedema if their BMI is greater than 25. So why is BMI important? So we want to be able to calculate BMI for these patients, um, or there's many um, apps and programs out there that will cal calculate the BMI for you. Um, patients who are overweight, above 25, or obese are, we want to get these patients into a healthy 20 to 25 zone and we can calculate the weight. Sometimes patients want to know a number. What, 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 how much weight do they need to be to be at 20 to 25 or under 25? And you can do the formula and figure that out for them and then give them a number. It's been shown that there's a higher risk of breast cancer and poorer outcome um, if, if they're with an increased BMI for those patients with breast cancer reoccurrence. So being overweight at the time of breast cancer diagnosis and weight gain after is linked to poorer survival. So again, weight gain is, is very common after breast cancer diagnosis, and we want to educate these patients from an early time that they need to start moving and start making sure that the weight gain doesn't happen after. Okay, so um, I think that's... The conclusion is, I think we, the overwhelming thing is that you get encourage patients to walk, to move, to do whatever program they can do, do some resistance training, and make sure that they lead an active lifestyle um, when even before they have lymphedema, if they have lymphedema, or if they're suffering from um, treatment after after some sort of cancer surgery. Okay, so. Anybody have any questions for me about the exercise section? Uh, uh, pretty clear. Um,
No questions? No. No from my side. Yes. Okay. So we're going to um, quickly talk about two more sections. One is compression garments. And the next section, and then the final section we'll go over is how to do measuring. And we'll talk about uh, both of these in class again when, when in Nairobi when we come together. So for compression garments, um, again, there's many different um, companies that do compression garments. These are a few of the ones that are big here in the U.S. Uh, again, BSN Medical. Can you mute again? Oh, sure. Okay, so BSN Medical, Juzo, and Medi are, are the big big ones that we see here in the U.S. Um, and hopefully we can connect you with the, the appropriate um, vendors in, uh, in East Africa. Okay, so um, a few things that you might want to know. Uh, circular knit garments, we'll talk about circular knit, flat knit. Uh, flat knit is when they take um, one flat piece of, of material and they um, finish it with with a seam, and that and then that flat piece has a, a higher resistance and compression. Um, ready to wear or off the shelf are some common terms that you might see. Circular knit garments are garments that don't have any seams in them. Uh, these are very frequently used. Most of the ready-to-wear garments that you're going to see um, in your clinics are going to be circular knit uh, garments. Um, many times they're used as a prophylactic garment for patients who are at risk for lymphedema, uh, patients who have mild to moderate lymphedema, and patients who can't afford the custom-made garments. So the custom-made, um, these are the, the ready-to-wear garments. They're circular knit. They don't provide as much compression as the flat knit garments. Um, they're usually thin and available in many different styles and colors. They're, uh, like I said, sold as ready-to-wear products, um, but they're not as strong and flat as the flat knit garments. Um, and we shouldn't use these if the patient's limb does not fit the sizing chart or simply requires a greater amount of compression. Um, they might slip into the soft tissue or creases. You can see here how there's a crease at the top of the knee, um, possibly right at the ankle, and that can cause uh, a tourniquet effect, and we don't want that. So measuring and um, getting a patient into the correct garment is very important. Uh, so flat knit garments are the ones that are very um, good for lymphedema therapy, um, but they are more expensive. So they're usually custom made and, um, you know, you have to order them, you, you have to measure them. And we'll talk a little bit about um, Alvarex, which is a, a, a common one that BSN makes, and it's a custom made garment um, and they make it in Germany, and they, they ship it all over the world. Um, it doesn't take long. It's a little more expensive, but um, like I said, it's ideal for patients with lymphedema because it is custom made, um, and it is measured to fit them properly, um, and it provides more compression. Uh, so these are cut and sew garments. They're not recommended for patients with lymphedema. Uh, maybe head and neck patients might use these. Um, they're more for patients with burns. Uh, we'll talk about different compression classes. Um, compression is usually specified in millimeters of mercury. Um, return ready, The ready-to-wear garments, the compression is usually noted as 15 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, etc. Uh, the flat knit garments, they're, they're, they list them in classes. So it'll be uh, CCL 1, 2, 3, 3 Forte, 4, and 4 Super. So uh, usually you, when you see the, um, the classes, you'll know that it's a ready-to-wear, uh, sorry, a, a custom-made garment. Uh, the ready-to-wear, you're going to see them as, um, as numbers, millimeters of mercury. So these, this is just a diagram going over the different types of Alvarex custom-made garments. Um, and um, 
we can go through these quickly. There's different classes of garments. Um, the class one is for mild lymphedema. If someone has trouble putting on their a more a higher class garment, we might um, prescribe class one for them. It might be start, a starting gar garment for pediatric lymphedema. Um, and it's more to prevent lymphedema from occurring. So if a patient doesn't have lymphedema, but they're at risk or they're feeling like uh, there's a heaviness or a fullness, we might put them in a lower compression garment. Uh, class two is more for moderate lymphedema of the upper extremity or mild lymphedema of the lower extremity. So the lower extremity, we usually have a higher compression garment on than upper extremity. Um, if the patient is obese, then uh, you might put them in, in if, and they have moderate to severe lymphedema, if they have trouble putting on a garment, then we might use a lower class uh, garment because the lower class garment is going to be easier to put on. It's, it's not as strong. Um, and patients who have trouble putting on their garments, we might have to go to a lower class garment. Class three um, is recommended for moderate lymphedema of the lower extremity, um, and it's an ideal starting gar garment if they have severe lower extremity lymphedema, um, if they don't have um, prior experience with custom-made garments. So again, you know, it's, it's really a judgment call. We're going to have to use our experience to figure out which class we want to um, put them in, but typically you want to have enough compression in their upper extremity so that you're not having a reoccurrence of their lymphedema. Um, but you don't want to have so much compression that they have, they have trouble, trouble putting it on and they're not going to be compliant with wearing it. Um, again, this, the classes go up. Um, someone with severe lymphedema in the lower extremity, um, we might um, put them into a class three forte. Um, and then, of course, even more than that, if they have severe lymphedema, we're going to go up into class four and class four super. Um, these are some pictures of the custom made garments. You can get custom made garments with um, different finger lengths where the therapist can decide how far they want the, the fingers uh, garment to go. Um, this is the middle picture is a um, Alvarex is the custom made garment that um, Jobst makes. Um, in Germany, and this is a glove to the elbow, um, and then there's something called gauntlet. So when you see the word gauntlet, um, that means that the fingers are not in, are not in included in that garment. Um, they have different padding options and pockets for people who have lymphedema in their hand, um, or if somebody has flaccid paralysis and you can't, you know, they need a zipper, they can add those on. Custom garments have a lot of different options of things. Um, different sleeves that, that you can get um, custom made. There can, you can you get one all the way up over the shoulder so that it's not falling down. Um, there's something called, this product called It Stays. It's a bottle like this. It's like a glue that you just put on your skin and uh, leave it for a few minutes and then you put the garment on and it keeps the garment from falling down. Um, so when you're, when, when we're measuring, uh, for garments, um, they have specific forms depending on which company. This is a Jobst, uh, this is a BSN medical Jobst form. Um, and you want to fill out the form for the, for the company that you're going to be ordering from. Um, it looks kind of complicated in the in when you look at the form, but it's actually if you just follow, you know, try to fill out every box and look at the pictures and read the descriptions of what you're supposed to do, it's actually not that hard or it's not that complicated. Like you'll see for the arm one, you're going to get a measurement here of the circumference around the wrist and then at different points where they tell you to, and then you're going to get the different lengths, and then you're going to measure the whole length of the arm to see how so that you know how long to make this garment. And if you have questions, you can always call them or there are reps in the area that can help you um, if we're gonna go with custom made garments. But for the most part, I think for you guys, we're gonna um, probably see you using the ready to, ready to wear garments just because they are readily available and um, you know the custom made ones are gonna be a little more expensive. So if a patient has trouble putting their garment on, there are some um, 
some things that we can do, like I talked about the lotion, the glue, that it stays glue. Uh, rubber gloves, so using gardening gloves with a little bit of rub, rubber on them, those are going to be, um, that's going to be something that, uh, you know, you might want to have in the clinic and then you can show the patient um, that if they get a pair of gloves, it's going to be easier for them to put their garments on. Um, and then sometimes they can get some of these other products that come uh, that help put help put the garments on. Garment washing, um, you, they want to follow the manufacturer's guidelines, but basically you want to wash your garments frequently um, in lukewarm water. They can hang dry them. Um, some of them can be put in the dryer, but usually we recommend hang, hang drying them. There's no special detergent, but they don't recommend anyone use woolite when they're washing their garments uh, as it'll break down the material. So again, this is a chart that goes over the upper extremity garments um, from the three different companies and what you know how you would decide which compression class to put them in. Let's say you're using Medi garments. Um, so if they have very mild lymphedema, you would for upper extremity, you would probably put them in in 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Or if they have mild to moderate, maybe you're going to go up into um, 30 to 40. Or t if they're having trouble putting it on, maybe you might stick to 20 to 30. And then for uh, moderate to severe, I think the most you're going to uh, really, you might, you might then go into, um, Medi also has flat knit or custom garments, a class one or a class two uh, garment. Lower extremity garments, these are garments that go up, there's garments that go to the knee, um, there's garments with, um, this is a custom made garment that you can have a zipper added on for easier for them to put it on. Um, the thigh garments, they'll go up to the thigh or you can, um, they have capri styles that go all the way up to the trunk. Um, and this is just showing different options of, you know, uh, different ways you can have the toes open, um, that you can have a, this is called a slant top. This is a straight top. Um, whatever you feel is going to be the best fit for the patient. Um, there's some with silicone dotted bands. This is again, just to help with comfort and to help keep it on. These are again, um, so these are, these are the compression stockings that, um, you can get different styles. If they only have one leg, you can get something like this. Um, you can get you know, full stockings without the toes. You can get full stockings with the toes, but only one side, only halfway down the other side of the leg. You can get capris, you can get biker shorts. There's all sorts of choices once you go, once you do, if you do custom made, then you can pretty much decide what, what is best for the patient. Um, again, these are capri style or bike, biker shorts. Sometimes Sometimes patients will need to layer so that they get the best benefits from their compression. So they might wear a thigh-high compression garment and then wear a biker short on top to give them more compression at the in the thigh. Um, again, so the foot options, you can have a slant open toe, a straight toe, or a closed toe. Um, this is just, again, different options for comfort. Sometimes patients, um, instead of doing finger and toe bandages, they might do a, something called a foot cap, and this would prevent lymphedema from going into their toes. Uh, again, you might do a combination of a knee-high and a capri style, just so that you have options and it's a little more comfortable and it gives good compression uh, higher up. Again, just different combinations that people do. They'll do a knee high with a thigh high with a biker short, and that's giving them gradient compression all the way up into their trunk. Okay, so this is what the lower extremity form looks like. Again, it's pretty simple. If you go through each layer and just fill in the boxes, um, you can then fa fax it over to this company, and then they're going to look through and make sure that everything looks good. They might email you or call you if they think that a number is off. Um, but eventually, uh, once it's ordered, it only takes about three days or so for them to make this garment, and then they're going to ship it out to you. These are just some um, aids that they, they sell here in the U.S. to help people. Uh, you know, this one, 
helps the patient get the, the, the garment on if they're having trouble with it. Um, we can talk about those. And then this is a, this is a chart that goes over, uh, you know, what class of um, garment you're going to choose for the different types of lymphedema. Uh, we have mild, you're going to go with the lower class um, lymphedema. Then you, for mild to moderate, you might go into a 30 to 40. Um, and then again, for moderate to severe, you might want to go with a custom made garment. Okay, so um, are any any questions? Anybody have any questions so far? Um, I'll just take it off mute here so we can hear everybody. Anybody have any questions about the garments? No. Okay, so our final. Uh, yes. Hi, this is Victoria. Hi. Hi. I have a question concerning the exercises. Mm -hmm. I have had patients coming to me that when they do some activities like gardening or washing clothes, then the, the, the swelling and increases. And of course, we are encouraging them to do exercises. How do you advise them when it comes to that? So. My question to that patient would be, first of all, do they wear any type of compression garment when they're doing that activity? If they're telling you that they're not wearing their compression garment, then they need to start doing that. If they're, if, if they're doing some housework like laundry and they know they're going to be doing a little bit of lifting and they're getting symptoms, then they definitely need to be in compression um, during the activity. If if they are already wearing the, the garment and it's still causing um, swelling, then either they need to cut back on the, that particular activity. Maybe they, if they're doing gardening for half an hour, they need to do five or ten minutes at a time um, and see if they can handle the amount of time without getting swelling. So they definitely don't want to do any activities that causes more swelling um, if they're already wearing their garment. Um, and then you might want to look at the garment and see if it's adequate. Maybe they need to get a higher compression garment for when they're going to do those activities. Um, it's possible that they need, you know, a little higher, a little stronger compression when they're going to be working and doing uh, different the activities that cause the swelling. Does that, okay. does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Then concerning the compression uh, garments, yes, you find that the ones which we um, they available like in Kenya, we have the circular made. Yes. And uh, most of the patients, you'll find that during the summer season when it is too hot, yeah, they cannot be able to bear wearing the garments. When they wear them, then they complain that actually. They feel a lot of tension and they cannot really uh, persevere having them on. Yeah. Uh, such patients, how do you advise to keep on to maintain to ensure that the swelling is not increasing? Yeah, and it's a big problem with this, you know, compliance. If they're if they're too hot, then they're not going to want to wear the garment, obviously. Um, but you know, you have to tell them that there's the risk of them getting increased swelling from not wearing it, uh, in addition to the heat, right? So heat, heat will increase. We talked about active hyperemia last time, um, yeah. and the heat will cause an increased lymphatic load. So there's potential for them to get really, um, you know, worse lymphedema. So, you know, you just have to educate the patient and try your best to see if maybe, Maybe during the summer months, something is better than nothing. Maybe during those months when it's hot, they need to get a lower compression garment, maybe a slightly uh, less compression, uh, a lower one, and maybe that won't be feel so bad for them. Uh, I guess it's still going to be hot for them, but maybe they'll be more compliant. Um, maybe, you know, just... If they are getting some swelling, I, I, I would recommend, I would say the bandages are just going to be just as hot. Patients who are going through um, bandaging therapy, like let's say in the active phase of your treatment, they're going to complain of the same problem, that the bandages are going to feel hot in the summer, in the, in the warm months. 
Um, but you, you know, you have to try to try your best to educate these patients that this is in the best interest for their fluid and to reduce their fluid, they're going to have to wear the compression. There's really no way around it. Um, and, you know, patients are going to do what, what's comfortable for them, but it's your job to educate them about what's the best thing for them. Okay. Yeah. Then, then based on the concept that uh, when it is hot, the swelling increases, is it advisable to, ad to uh, advise the patients to use a cold pack when it is too hot? Um there's no there's nothing showing that there's any problem with using a cold pack um i don't think it's it, i mean it, it's not really going to systemically do much it's going to um make them feel better um uh as long as they're doing it safely you know they're not leaving it on for too long their skin is already sensitive so you want to make sure that they don't get a burn from having a cold pack on for too long i don't think there's a problem with it um but you don't, you know, it's not a, it's not a common recommendation to use an ice pack. I mean, we tell patients who have swelling, like post-surgical swelling, or if they have, you know, post-injury, we always tell people to put an ice pack on, on their swelling, and it tends to help the local swelling. But lymphedema patients have a whole systemic swelling issue. It's not coming from a local edema. Um, the problem is the lymphatic system is, is overloaded. So that ice pack might cool them down for a little while, but it's not going to, it's not going to change the problem unless, you know, they're doing the proper compression and keeping the whole area, um, from getting, uh, from getting overloaded. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll talk about the final topic and then we'll be done for today. Uh, we're going to talk about measuring. I'm going to just mute everybody again. Um, so we're going to talk about measuring. Um, there's different ways to do measurements, but uh, we're going to try and do our own standardized measurements so that uh, using a tape measure, because this is, the, this is shown to be the most, um, you know, reproducible, effective, and, um, you know, reliable method to take measurements for the patient. Um, so measurements are taken, um, you, try to, you try to mark it off so that you, know, you do the same measurements every time, or let's say one time you do the measurements and the next time your colleague does the measurements, they know that they're doing the measurements in the same place. So it's important to be reliable within even your own facility and know what uh, measurements are being taken. So, this measurement uh, pictures are showing, uh, you know, they're taking the first measurement at the MTPs and then there's measuring at the heel and then they're taking the tape measure and they're marking off every 10 centimeters and making a mark on the leg and then they're doing their cir circumferential uh, measurements around those spots. So you would fill up your paper, uh, your chart and then based and then the next time you came to do the measurements, you would go back to those same measurements so you could compare. So you can make a form just like this, a typical form. Um, there's one at the end of this handout that you can use. Uh, there's some measuring boards that, you know, you can ask BSN locally if they'll provide you with a board. Sometimes they make it easier um, just because you can line it up at the 10 and then go to 20 and then you can do the measurements quickly that way. Um, and it's just, it, you know, it, it just uh, every time it makes it quick and easy and you're at the same spot. Um, so, you know, the advantages, like I said, for taking the, using the tape measure, uh, they're straightforward, portable, inexpensive, and quick to, to have the tape measure. You don't need any, uh, you know, specific equipment. It can, you can do it on any skin condition. You can sterilize the tapes between the patients. Um, you can use paper tapes if the patient has wounds or something, um, and, and and adequate for determining the changes in in the peripheral edema. Um, the disadvantage of using the tape is you can't. It's hard to measure lobular tissue, um, and, and sometimes there's no there's no change in the in side to side. So you won't see, you know, in early stages of lymphedema, you might not see any any. You might not be able to measure the volume difference. Um, 
And, and then, of course, there's the reliability. It's challenging to ensure that the tape measure is exactly in the same location every time. So what's the difference between limb volume and edema volume? Uh, limb volume takes into account all of the tissues, including the bone and the muscle mass. Um, and then edema volume is just reflecting the volume of the edema or the excess volume in the limb. Um, and when you do um, edema volume, the volume um, of the, uh, you're not taking in, into account the volume of the unaffected limb. For limb volume, you're, you have to have an, an unaffected side so you can compare the difference. So it's going to be 20% more than the other side or 40% more than the other side. You need to have an unaffected side so you can compare. Even if you have both, if you have bilateral lymphedema, you still um, can show a difference that one side is usually one side is usually worse than the other. So um, there is a way to calculate limb volume. Um, and basically what you're doing is volume is equal to C squared divided by pi. So uh, C is circumference. So basically we're taking little, um, you know, uh, some cylinders of the whole arm all the way up and then we're adding them up and dividing by pi. Um, so that's how you do the, the, the measurements for or the, the limb volume calculation. There is a software out there. It's a limb volume calculation software. Um, you can get it uh, at limbvolumes.org. There's a free tutorial. This uh, so software is great to have, but you're going to be paying for it. Um, if you want, you can just create your own um, you know, your own tablet and have an Excel spreadsheet where you put in your, your figures for all your measurements and then you can put the, you can create the formula and come up with a volume that way. So if you have questions on that, um, we can talk about that. But basically, um, when we, in the end, when we're trying to say, you know, what did this patient get better? Was there a percent change of edema? You're going to take the final volume, um, subtract it from the initial volume, and then um, take into account the volume of the unaffected limb, and you're going to get a percentage of reduction in volume. So a little bit of calculations, but you can also set up Excel spreadsheets um, or have your IT department help you with this. And then once, you're, once your formulas are set up, then you can just plug in the numbers when you take measurements. Um, you know, the water displacement is a true way of, the best way of calculating limb volume, but um, this is not something that most of us can do in our clinics. Um, there's also something called pyrometry. Again, this is, these are not things we're going to do. Body weight, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, pretty easy to calculate someone's BMI, um, and you can, you know, try and do... Um, B, a BMI calculation for them or use a formula or an app on your phone. Um, and then you can try and tell them, uh, you know, you need to lose so much weight so that you can get into a lower BMI category. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about these other methods, bioimpedance, tonometry. These are different ways of measuring volume. Um, skin calipers, they, you know, sometimes skin calipers are used by trainers. Um, but it's difficult sometimes to, to measure and be reproducible. So we're going to stick to our volume measurements using our tape measure. Photographs, when we're doing documentation, it's really, really important to take photographs uh, if we can at the beginning of their treatment and at the end or in, in between to show progress. Sometimes, I don't know about in East Africa, but over here insurance companies are really big about showing, uh, you know, big changes. So we take photographs when we do our initial assessment and we save them in the patient's file electronically. Um, this is just, uh, you know, some, some guidelines for some short-term goals and long-term goals that you might want to write on your evaluation. Um, so these are really important short-term goals that, you know, we really want to focus on. Patient and caregiver will understand lymphedema precautions to decrease the risk of infection and exacerbation of lymphedema. Patient will develop a tolerance for wearing multi-layer short stretch bandages between treatment sessions. So, you know, some patients, they need to be motivated to wear these bandages. We can, if they're really not going to wear them for the full time between sessions, 
then we might that might be our goal is to build up their time so that they will um, wear them for longer and longer. The patient will decrease um, will experience a decrease in the in their edema uh, or their pitting edema. Um, body weight will be compared to changes in edema, so you can monitor their body weight. Uh, patient will perform home exercise program with minimal assistance. Uh, patient will perform self MLD. So self MLD is a is a is something that takes a while for a patient to learn how to do um, manual lymph drainage on themselves, but it is something that um, they can definitely do, and then they can definitely um, learn to do after you know you when you're doing your your manual lymph drainage on them and you're talking to them. Um, you can start to show them how they can do it on themselves. Our long-term goals are going to be um, a patient will be independent with their bandaging if they need to be if they if you need to show them how to do it for themselves or maybe a, a caregiver can learn to do the bandages for them. Um, they will have increased range of motion and mobility. Patient will be independent with getting their compression stockings on and off and be compliant with wearing them. Um, nighttime compression application, in, in case we need to do nighttime compression, um, we will have achieved maximum edema reduction uh, so that they'll be more functional, uh, reduce risk of falling, uh, fitting into standard size clothing and shoes and returning to their prior level of function. Another long-term goal, goal could be patient will be independent with home exercise program and lymphedema management. Um, you know, this is talking about goals for lipedema. Lipedema patients have a lot of skin sensitivity, so the goal would be to reduce the pressure sensitivity um, for these patients. Um, and again, weight management. So oftentimes with lipedema patients, we're advising them to do an anti-inflammatory diet and, and helping them with their weight because this is a fat accumulation in the body more than fluid. Um, the Lipedema Life Impact Scale, I'll, I'll bring a copy for, of this for you guys. Basically, it's a 18-item it's a uh, questionnaire that a uh, couple of therapists um, who are um, certified lymphedema therapists, they came up with. And it's basically a, it's a questionnaire that you give to your patient similar to, um, you know, if you ask them to do a functional, any sort of functional uh, handout. Um, or a functional scale. This is something that you can ask them. You get a score at the end, and then you can compare it by giving it to them later on. Um, and there's just some questions that it's just rated one to five, and the patient circles uh, their answer to the question. Um, some forms that are at the end of this section um, that I can show you. This is, uh, you know, the, the form that you can use for upper extremity when you're keeping track of, in your chart, you're keeping track of all your measurements. Up here, you would write, you know, the measurements were taken every four centimeters or 10 centimeters. Um, in the upper extremity, typically you won't do 10 centimeters because that's too far apart. Um, you want to do maybe four or six centimeters apart. Um, if you're trying to get limb volume, then in the lower extremity, you want to do four centimeters apart as well so that you can add up those, um, add up all, you're going to square each of those circumferences, add them up, and then divide by pi to get uh, limb volume. Um, this, th there's some handouts here that, um, that talk about, are very detailed handouts, information sheets. You want to get some information from your par patients. We can talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in your clinic, uh, the intake forms, and we're going to be trying to come up with some intake forms that maybe are a little more condensed so that they're, they're good for you to give to your lymphedema patients, um, but they're maybe not uh, so long. Um, but, you know, basically when a patient comes in, you want to know about, uh, you want to ask them about their swelling, you want to ask them about what triggers the swelling, um, if they've had surgery, if they've had lymph nodes removed, these are all really important questions for you to know. Uh, have they had radiation therapy? Have they had chemo? Uh, have they had any cellulitis? Is there any family history of lymphedema? Do they have pain? Oftentimes lymphedema patients don't have any pain, uh, but you want to know if they do. Uh, what is their loss of function or, or, or mobility? 
Um, what do they have trouble with any of the following activities? Um, do they have any other medical conditions? Are they have any allergies um, to any tape or things like that? Do they have any medications? Um, pregnancy is important. You want to know if they're pregnant so you can avoid uh, abdominal MLD. Um, have they had previous treatment? You want to know if they've tried anything else um, that might maybe some somebody's tried a pump before and and they know that really works for them. Uh, do they wear compression sleeves? Do they have uh, compression at night? How much are they exercising? Um, so these are some, what are their goals with the therapy? These are some of the questions. And then when we do our assessment, you know, the things we're looking for is we can be, uh, we can be checking their scale, uh, the pitting scale, how, how much pitting do they have in their, um, how much pitting is, is in their edema. Um, you can use a key like this to mark off on the diagram. Like if they've had radiation fibrosis, you can mark it down. If they have a scar, you can put that down on the body diagram. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, that you want to get their height and their weight. You want to check for a stemmer sign. Stemmer sign is in, in the fingers or their toes where you're taking their um, skin and they're, you're pinching it like this and then you're you're trying to see if they have if they if you can't pinch their skin then that's a the positive sign um for lymph, lymphedema uh when did the lymphedema start what is their major complaint have they had surgeries again you can write down all the all the surgeries um what other uh what are their functional problems um, so some of this is you can capture either in the intake form or you can capture it in your evaluation form. Um, some of it's some of it's kind of twice. And then uh, what are their problems? You can have you can either put them like this or you can write out their problems. You're going to write out you know check off their short-term goals and long-term goals. These are all very important with JCIA compliant forms. Um, and then we're going to write down what our treatment plan is going to be. Um, we can also in our assessment write down, uh, you know, what we think, what stage we think they're at in their lymphedema. Um, and that's pretty much it for the form. Um, anybody have any questions at all about uh, measuring and documentation? We're all clear with that. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our session for uh, the third session for lymphedema. Um, if you uh, if you guys have any other questions, please let me know. Um,